This is mostly a um, discussion. There's only two slides, and um, it's been a problem that was uh, bugging me for a while. And the recent case of a certain um, embargo fix that came out about a month ago and broke all my stuff for a whole two weeks kind of prompted um, an attempt to try and fix that. Um, so the, the, the embargo issue stuff, it was um, created relatively recently, like it, it's only about three, four, five years old, ever since Meltdown, Spectre, and all of that came out. But we've been seeing a constant flow of um, kind of embargoed fixes going into the kernel. Some of them are more um, public than others. And we've been seeing a um, too large amount of issues with the embargoed code that was landing upstream and breaking a bunch of systems. Yeah. Yes. Aggressively. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we skipped like one forward. Okay. All right. Um, and so this creates a few problems. One of them is that the set of folks working on the bar code uh, fixes is pretty small, which kind of breaks the kernels. If a lot of people see the, the, the code, then bugs are easy to find. Uh, it also sees limited testing. There is a concern that if we try and do more extensive testing with embargoed fixes, then we will risk the embargo itself. Uh, someone might see us testing it, uh, the fix might leak, and that will kind of make a mess of the embargo. Uh, it's also the case that embargoed fixes are relatively complex. They rarely just like check if something is null or return this error code. They're usually um, big refactorings of of often the, the how we compile code, we often change uh, complex assembly code. Uh, so, so like all the fixes themselves are something that would normally be reviewed upstream for weeks or months before being accepted. And it's also the case that there's no documentation. A lot of the fixes are, well, the CPU behaves in this way, and if we do this word quirk, then it suddenly works. So they just do it. Uh, so there's no way to verify that we're kind of doing the right thing with embargo fixes. Um, there were a few, thoughts of what we can do here uh, in the past. One of them is, is a dedicated tester group. Uh, the doc that we have in the kernel tree says that, that we can pull in people who are needed for testing code, but this wasn't done extensively in the past, or at least I'm not aware of a case where it was done even once. Um, we also have, so usually these issues are within processors. Um, and it's usually the case that there's other companies that can test code and have NDAs with a certain hardware vendor and could assist there. But there were similar concerns with testing. Like if we throw some code into like Microsoft or Google infrastructure and we run a big test on it, someone else might spot that something's going on and, and kind of try and sneak out and, uh, and see what's being tested and then break the embargo. Uh, we've been thinking about setting up dedicated test infrastructure, and I heard from the Intel folks that they are trying to do something like that on the zero-day bot. I'm not sure what the extent there is, but as far as I'm aware of, there's nothing kind of dedicated to um, the embargo code. Uh, there was thinking we can use like a dedicated kernel CI lab or something like that, where we can populate with some machines and test it out. Uh, it's also the case that we don't know which tests to run. There's no like one big kernel test. A lot of it is different. Um, test suites, different tests. A lot of it is tests that end users end up running, you know, in their environments. Like a lot of the testing is, you know, users or companies testing during release candidate stages and finding bugs and reporting them. Um, and, and this is not something that works well with the embargoed model. And so this is where my slides end. And this is where I'm, I'm looking for opinions about how this can be improved. Um, and I'll go after, like after the talk is done, I'll go back to the recording and try and create notes out of it and post them to um, in case I'm going to discuss. Um, if anyone wants to start with opinions, thoughts. Yeah. Where's the mic? Who wanted it? So when you speak of tests, are you referring to tests that are going to test the fix that's come in or tests that are there to make sure that you know we didn't break anything in trying to fix this hardware bug? So, so both real, right? Like we had a few breakages where we thought we fixed the actual problem that, that was being embargoed and that wasn't true. We also had cases where we thought we fixed the embargoed problem and we broke something else that wasn't supposed to break. 
uh, we had cases where things worked, but there was a massive performance hit that wasn't supposed to be here, and we had to go back and re-engineer the problem. Um, I would say all of the above. Right. So my question is, where are the tests coming from? Are they coming from the hardware vendors? Are they coming from some other source? So, so that's a great question. Right now, they're not coming from anyone. Ideally, they would come from the users who care about this. So, so like, if we care about certain workloads working after it fixes, we could provide tests. Uh, this is similar in spirit to what kernel CI does, right? When you can kind of plug in your test and it will run in for you. Um, but right now we don't have that infrastructure to provide tests to be run for embargo issues, right? That there's no way for me to say, um, hey, Intel, if, if you fix this issue, please run my tests here. Uh, that there's no connection like that. And even if we would do that, it would be um, a one-off, right? That would kind of do it for me, but what do other people do? Uh, we need a more systematic way of doing that, in my opinion. I'm not that good at throwing. Oh. Try it. Yeah. Hi, Sasha. Um, it, how much of this do you rely on distros to participate in doing your testing here? Because uh, you know, this is something exactly what distros, you know, like I'm from Red Hat, this, you know, this is kind of our bread and butter, and, and we're able to contain the embargoes inside. Um, you know, if we had a standardized testing infrastructure, like all the, you know, the discussions we had earlier with KUnit, KTAP, and all that stuff, if, if distros all standardize upon all that stuff and could run those tests on their particular hardware and somehow in a secure way communicate that up to upstream, would that be useful in any way? So, so I thought some distros do it to some extent, right? The credit participates in some of the embargo development that tests some of the stuff. Uh, I think that the tricky part is that the, the the amount of tests there isn't what we would want it to be, right? We would want to run more real workloads, right? Like we can always run self-test, we can always run KUnit, uh, but we need to also find a way to run with like real end user workloads. Uh, it's also the case that we can't open it to all distros, right? So like a lot of the distros are um, a commercial company like Reddit, which we can do, Reddit, so a, but Debian, for example, there's no way to give the Debian community an embargo fix and ask them to, um, to test it quietly, right? There's no such mechanism. And, and that's something that we saw like originally get like the Debian community saying if there was an embargo fix, these are the workloads they want, and then companies like Red Hat could run those workloads and help out in that direction. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be like credit, but but like some mechanism in the community that would do that. But I just don't think we have a structure right now that would um that would allow that to happen. We, we don't have that dedicated tester organization person group that would um take tests or collect the tests and, and run them on behalf of various customers. Um, it also raises questions of who owns the test infrastructure, right? Well, let's say I have like 20 Google tests I want to run. I can't give you like, you know, the whole infrastructure and I can't maintain it outside of my company. So, so it can't be like, we need to minimize the amount of entities in play here, I think, rather than trying to overload some. I mean, at Red Hat, we, we do a lot of internal tests and we have a lot of infrastructure. Sometimes it's just, um, we do the best of what we can for what tests we should be running, but you know, we also have that same opportunity because we're running on upstream is to expand our test suite that maybe not be Red Hat specific or work workloads that are not Red Hat specific, but we can maybe participate. Yeah, and I think that this is something that will benefit Red Hat even outside of the, the embargo story, right? Like you want to run more tests before you release a distro. Um, You do have the issue, though, at least, you know, and I've, you know, I've watched a lot of these embargo fixes as they go through and you know, patches are ready in these things. Uh, you know, a lot of times the timeline, it's the fixes aren't done quickly enough that you've got ample time to test. And so, yeah, I mean, like we've got some great testing. Uh, you know, we, we've got a QA team that can test all kinds of stuff. But if there's not time to run a full test suite, I mean, you don't have a, a we don't have a week. Or if you do run it, you find something, all right, well, I can you know, go through and fix it. Uh, and that's, <clears throat> so I think we probably need access to, you know, some sort of a lab that could actually run several tests in parallel and do you know, that kind of testing, maybe in, in stages even. So here's a, here's a quick 
you know, here's a quick pass and, and we know these these things seem to be fairly good and then we've got uh, you know some workloads that are going to take longer to test and, and so you get various stages of feedback from it but I mean you know can we set that up somewhere in, in some sort of a thing where the the machines are secure um, you know and, and any user could could contribute to or, or could submit a build to it and you know get some testing feedback. I, I, so I think you pointed out two things here. One is that there's no enough time for testing at the end. And I think that this is a more systematic issue because usually embargoes are actually pretty long, right? You, like we saw embargoes of over a year, like we'll fix it in the middle of next year. So clearly there's time for testing there. But but I think that that we never budget time for testing. We, we like It has to be done like at the end of the year. Okay, so we'll finish the code on December 25 and then you can test for a day or two. Um, <laughs> And that's that's a separate problem. Well, I mean, it's it's tied to this, and it's definitely something I, I agree with you. We should highlight, and we should make it part of the process. Um, maybe making the statement that that the, the mitigation has to be code complete a month before it goes out of the embargo, or something like that. Uh, the, the second one is is actually I'm not sure. I, I understand where you want to go, but I'm not sure how we can create that structure of like what is that safe environment for embargoed code, like. Where would the machines live? Who would own them? Um, is it the Lynx Foundation? I mean, maybe but that's, or or is it Intel AMD? Maybe. And maintain them. Yeah. So why not use uh, kernel CI kind of infrastructure? Why not use existing ones? And uh, you can with kernel CI, you can go and add your tests if you like, and people can submit tests. Why not use that? Yeah, so, so I definitely agree on reusing the kernel CI infrastructure. I don't think we need to reinvent something new here. Uh, my my concern is around where or like how do we test and where are those um, machines hosted because we can't run embargo code on kernel CI because everyone can see what they're pulling from. Uh, it will need to be kind of parallel, separate story using the kernel CI code, but but separate infrastructure. But who will own that infrastructure and who will um, run that? Somebody commented, Mark um, commented on Debian um, does have a security team, manages. We were talking about Debian at the end, so just wanted to point that out. Yeah. For, for, um, for um, kernel, C, kernel CI hosting, uh, that sounds like something yeah. that the Linux Foundation might be able to help with. I mean, kernel CI is a Linux Foundation project already, but um, yeah, it feels like something that the you know, it's shared infrastructure that everybody uses. So it, it does feel like a good fit for Linux Foundation. It, it feels like between kernel CI and OpenSSF, both of them being Linux Foundation, we, we could find a middle ground there. Um, I, I think that the concerns then become of the embargo itself and like NDA between parties because kernel CI doesn't have a notion of NDAs and they don't pick OpenSSF. As a notion of NDA, so we'll need to introduce like it's, it becomes a difficult organizational structure to support it here. So you could have an option that when you're you know, when you're submitting a kernel to to test that you know there's, there's a checkbox that essentially says this is private, and if you do that and you hide the the data behind that, I mean you know it, it's. I think that that would be enough. So nobody else can see your results, unfortunately. That sucks. Yeah. But you can see them. You can share them with the team, um, you know, with, with the people you're working with. Or yeah. you can, depending upon, you know, embargoes are different. Um, it, it depends on the embargo. Something like Spectrum Meltdown, where companies weren't even allowed to talk to each other about it, even though they were read in, that's a problem. But for once, a typical embargo where there's, you know, there's a list people can talk. And here's a link to my... Uh, Test results, or you know, here's here's my test results. You can you can actually send that out to the list and talk to those people. Mm -hmm. But when you submit it, as, as the submitter, you're the only one who can see the results. Good. Yeah. One thing about hardware uh, access is we need to remember that it can't be a one and done kind of thing, because hardware evolves. Right. One of the challenges with a lot of the currently existing test pools is you know they were funded n years ago and they may have equipment that might have been state of the art five years ago 
and is perfectly good for you know running arbitrary you know power five tests say um but won't necessarily be good if you actually need a fairly recent networking card or cpu depending on where the embargoed code lives um and then the other thing to remember is uh some of the testing which you might need to do might actually require a fairly hefty machine like you know being able to run a postgres database this is very, very different from a single board ARM uh, motherboard that might be in a kernel CI infrastructure. So it's a very, very expansive sort of area. And that's going to be the challenge with, um, you know, trying to do centralized hardware, which is it gets expensive and then someone needs to keep it up to date because otherwise companies lose interest after the year, first year or two. And then we have older equipment and then, you know, the problem hits again in a couple of years. I would also say centralized hardware is no longer going to be a reality because some of the geopolitics around it. For instance, none of our boards are going to turn up in a set up in the US. Good point. I mean, could we could we have a can we embargo make a test suite that is embargoed itself that can be deployed? So like um and they might have to develop lazily over the years. Like we have a base set of tests, we run it, checks out, it gets publicly released, like the, the patches. Somebody else finds a bug in their, finds a bug with their use case. So then the next step would be, well, if you want to contribute, you can make your test case part of our embargo test suite. That I, can run. I, I don't think it has to be um, an embargo test suite, right? Like right now you can run in theory, tests on an embargoed code with, with all the test suites you want. The, the question is how you do that. Like, I don't think that the tests themselves need to be secret. Um, I, I think you're talking about let's standardize the test suite we run for the embargoed issues. Well, I mean, if, if there's certain users who have a very like intellectual property sort of test like environment or like a use case mm -hmm. and they don't want their use case to be public, could we make their use case embargoed as part of the suite and say, we don't know, like we're not gonna expose your use case to all the other, of your competitors, but at least we can run mm -hmm. it, you know, with a subset of, uh, you know, hardware vendors. Cause I, I see that problem with, as you know, come from a hardware company, you do as much testing as you can internally, and then your customers will find bugs because they have use cases that are unique to them and they may or may not wanna share that with you. And so it's sort of, you're in this weird, or paradox. Yeah, the, the, that's a difficult one, even without all the embargo right. stuff, like how do you test code? Well, um, possibly. Uh, it's it's probably just a, like a, a further phase, though, of let's add more secret tests on top of what we can uh, do, because right now I don't think we even run the open tests well. Um, So uh, not not an actual solution, because I think this would probably take you back around to the test groups thing. But I think we've kind of danced around the point of like, what if people were all running kernel CI? So at least even if people have their own tests that maybe rely on some internal infrastructure, if the endpoint, like the interface for that test and the test results all uh, match the same format, then at least coordinating between the embargoed parties, maybe that would be a little bit more feasible. So like standardizing kernel CI is an API rather than? Uh, yeah. So interesting. No. I think that's a good idea. No. Uh, but also, I just don't understand the scale of the problem because uh, we're mostly talking about like Spectre stuff, related fallout of Spectre, aren't we? Um, and, and, and others. Like but, it's been it's been the custom flow for the past three years now. Of like once people, a month. Of, yes, of yeah. uh, specter e uh, The rest is not really embargoed. Like if you report something to security at kernel .org, they embargo it for a week. You know, it's not a real embargo. There's a lot of ninety day embargoes as well. Not that much on uh, security at kernel .org. But, but not on the on on the hardware vulnerability stuff. There are pretty long embargo, and there's more than that. They, and they usually don't end up with security. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But they're not like the major majority of 
um, security bugs. They're not the majority of security bugs. I think that the majority of security bugs are handled well. I'm, I'm thinking the ones maybe I should have like explicitly said hardware embargo called that. I think most security bugs are handled fairly well. But they also tend to be some of the nastiest to fix, right? Because uh -huh. you're really trying to work around problems in the hardware and it's a workaround, it's a hack. And, and it ends up, yeah, you get performance problems out of it. You get all sorts of things because we weren't meant to run this way. Uh <laughs> So a um, couple of things, right? One is um, test itself. We do not know uh, what all the tests, that use, use cases and tests that mm -hmm. should be done and containing that test environment so that we are not leaking the information. And there are multiple things. Some of them could be fixed with policy. Some of them are, how do you know what tests we need to run mm -hmm. for that particular case? There is, um, it's, I think it's the, uh, some of the suggestions that came out, good suggestions. And I don't know that we can uh, identify, um, run, us saying, hey, run K-Unit or K-Self-Test, one of those will help. However, there is an unknown part of the tests or use cases that need to be run as well, as you're mentioning. Don't think I put it in the Wikipedia, right? It's a hardware bug. If it's a hardware bug, then the hardware, uh, whoever it is that's going to fix the bug is going to give us a patch and a test that goes with the patch, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that should be the norm. And then once we make sure the, the bug is fixed, then we want to make sure that the fix is not really having side effects in performance or something else, or perhaps breaking something else that we didn't expect it to break. And that's where we probably want to run as much of uh, test collateral that we have to make sure that you know nothing that we didn't expect happened. Yep. So the first part is really the key thing, right? Uh, the new tests to be written, because obviously the old test may not catch uh, yep. the leakage or whatever it is we're trying to uh, you know, fix. Yeah, so you need the new test to fix, to, to test the specific of the thing that was yeah, fixed, yeah. but you also need to be able to run the rest of your test battery and see that nothing breaks. Exactly. And some of it may require, just given how complex the issues are, so some of the test failures manifest as like data corruption, you know, that you don't know this on 2% of your machines. And and you can't test that scenario out because you can't roll out that, that embargoed kernel to your fleet and test it out, right? Because it's supposedly needs to say secret. And if you try and roll it out, someone might know this, that you're testing an embargoed code. So you're, you're blocked from testing of the more complex failure scenarios in, in this case. And this is what I'm trying to, to get to. Um, is that even reasonable to uh, address in the sense that you know, if I want to roll it out to a million machines to get the feedback from the entire fleet as part of the initial testing of the embargo code, that probably is uh, going to be difficult, right? So we do what we can, and then obviously we'll deal with issues that come out of uh, large-scale deployments, uh, as we normally do. Anything new that goes out to the fleet, we have safe deployment practices where we kind of slowly expand the radius, if you will, of the, the attack surface or whatever, the blast surface, really. Yeah. And then we roll it back if something bad happens. If there is nothing else. Any other questions? So more of a, a comment to annoy people than a, than a question, but um, one, uh, if we're looking for lots of hardware to run embargoed tests due to a hardware issue, um, the vendor that had the issue seems like an obvious option as the person who should provide all of the hardware to test it on. Um, if we had a you know, standard, you know, kernel CI API thing saying, hey, look, you know, unnamed hardware vendor, you've just told us you've got this really nasty issue with your uh, CPUs. Can you now give us a fleet to run a whole bunch of tests on? Here's an API endpoint we can guarantee is embargoed to put results. I think it's it's a fair point about who should provide the machines. I, I I don't think it answers the question of where the machines hosted, who keeps them alive, and who keeps kind of refreshing the fleet with, with and, and keeping everything going. 
And I guess it was pointed out mm. you can't put them in one data set or somewhere, right? It has to be also. Yeah, it, but equally, you don't oh, oh. necessarily need to keep those around forever. Like, if you're specifically testing one particular issue, um, well, you know, you so want. No. So one of the like the common case where we've had um, testing trouble with um, embargoed fixes, it's not been the hardware that had the issue that wasn't tested. It's been uh, splatter breaking other hardware. Uh, so, for example, we broke 32-bit um, EFI with one of the uh, hardware fixes we had uh, last year. Uh, and that was none of those platforms were affected by the issue that was being fixed. That is a tricky one. Um, <laughs> uh, the only other thing I'd, I'd quickly add is for people with weird uh, or, you know, large workloads that they've not been able to test or they've, you know, um, kept, want to keep secret, uh, hint, it would be very, very nice if, you know, we could get people who have these workloads that keep breaking when weird things happen to submit smaller, more sort of K-self-test, K-unit style tests that exercise the same thing in the cases where that's possible. It's not always possible, but uh, it would be nice. So, yeah, we have about uh, three minutes left. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Oh. So going back to everyone uses uh, kernel CI as a common API, if there was, I know there was some discussion in the past about using like the official kernel CI as more of like a database that other people can contribute test results to. So if we had, if we had embargo participants who own their own hardware, who are, have a vested interest in solving this problem, make their machines available for testing, they could use kernel CI as a common place to send results. We might just need to have some kind of like embargoed view of the test results. I don't know. But using kernel CI as just an API for different instances to talk to each other sounds like something that might be interesting. I can comment from uh, speaking with my hat on from a company that's very secretive. Uh, we're not going to put any hardware out there for people to to test on, and we're not going to give you test results for hardware that's I under mean, development. So, I, mean, I mean, I'm sorry, but that's no. That's also fine. It just becomes reality. Your, it becomes your company's problem. That's fine, right? Right, right. That's fine. Well, it doesn't matter because we're on a five, not five kernel anyway. So. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. I'll uh, summarize what we've discussed and I'll send the uh, mail in case I'm discuss once the recordings are up. Um, and I think we'll have a 30-minute uh, break.